Hello folks and welcome back. In this lecture we will be diving into the neo-Marxist perspective. And you know, I realize uh, many of you might not like <laughs> the sound of that. <laughs> like neo-Marxist isn't that, you know, communism or socialism or something. And you know, I would, uh, you know, I'm with you on that. I, I'm somebody, I don't consider myself to be a Marxist neo-Marxist or, or communist, any of those things, personally. I'm very much, a, I guess, a capitalist when you get right down to it. Uh, but nevertheless, I think there's plenty of useful concepts in here, and it's, it's, you know, this perspective asks some really important questions. And so basically, I think it's, it's worth exploring this perspective, even if you have no intention, you know, politically along those lines. Uh, it's just good stuff to know, and it is... Uh, if nothing else, a fascinating way to look at pop culture artifacts. So, <laughs> you know, with that disclaimer out of the way, basically, there's something here for everybody, uh, no matter what side of the political uh, fence you might be on, left or right. Uh, okay, uh, so to get started thinking about this issue, I want you to think about a particular scene in The Walking Dead. It's in the comic and the show, but it's where Rick goes into town on horseback looking like I don't know, some character from a classic Western. Uh, he screws up uh, kind of big time. He is uh, just making colossal errors of judgment. Uh, ends up having his poor old horse get eaten up by zombies, and he's, you know, finds himself basically in, you know, about to get eaten himself, and then Glenn you know, shows up, comes to his rescue, you know, helps him uh, get inside the tank. Um, you know, you remember the scene, and Rick is able to escape. <laughs> Uh, now, what I'm thinking, though, is normally this, this is kind of an unusual, if you think about it just in terms of uh, the jobs they had before the apocalypse. I mean, Glenn is described as being uh, into pizza delivery. You know, that's a, you know, I like having pizzas delivered. Sure, nothing wrong with that, but it's just not the type of job that you would, you know, if you went to a kindergarten class and asked, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? You're probably not going to get too many people saying uh, pizza delivery. <laughs> Uh, whereas Rick, uh, of course, being a deputy, so he's not a sheriff. A lot of people think he's a sheriff, but he's actually kind of an assistant to the sheriff, a, a deputy. He's been deputized, uh, you know, to help. But he is a law enforcement officer, based, you know, police officer, cop, whatever you want to call him. Uh, so normally, I think in most shows, uh, you would you would imagine a character like Glenn would need Rick's help. You know, not not the other way around, right? Rick would be the one that would be competent confident in the situation, uh, whereas Glenn would be the one needing his assistance. Uh, but that's kind of flipped around now because we're in this post-apocalyptic scenario. Everything's kind of been flipped on his head. Uh, so I just want you to think about that scenario a little bit and imagine, you know, watching it from your point of view, but then try to imagine what it would be like watching that if you were somebody from a different uh, economic status, you know, somebody really poor, really wealthy, uh, law enforcement background or pizza delivery, uh, you know, whatever. Just, just kind of have some fun with that. Uh, but really, I just want you to be, be thinking about what connection the economic status has to do with the way you interpret it and what you take away from that scenario. All right, so moving on then, we've got our objectives here. So we'll be defining some terms. If there's one thing a neo-Marxist is good for, it's coming up with vocab. <laughs> <laughs> quite a bit of jargon to work with. <laughs> and you pretty much have to learn this or you're just going to be, you know, constantly confused. So we'll try to make it as clear as possible. And, you know, as usual, I'll just say I'm going to be simplifying a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, if you really want the full, <laughs> you know, in-depth in explanation, you really have to go back and read some really difficult texts. You know, like if you try to read Karl Marx's books or... Uh, you know, Ingalls or Gramsci, you know, all the people that are referenced in this chapter, you're in for a very <laughs> intimidating read. <laughs> I mean, no joke, that's some hard reading. Um, so we'll have to make, you know, again, simplify a lot of things, gloss over stuff. But, but again, if you really want the, if you're serious about this perspective, you will have to tackle some of those uh, more complicated pieces. But I, but I think we can, I think you'll be able to get the gist of it from this lecture and from the chapter from Cell now. And so we'll be talking about subject positions, how those work with uh, what they call models and anti-models. We'll get into that, kind of like the protagonists and antagonists from before. Uh, we'll talk about what's meant by the term economic metaphor. 
what that is and how these uh, things make arguments about the haves and the have-nots. And then we'll evaluate the possible implications of such messages for the target audience, whoever the pop culture artifact is intended for, as well as a society at large. All right, so here's a bit about the neo-Marxist perspective. So like all of those perspectives we've been talking about, uh, neo-Marxism helps us see what pop, pop culture, whether that be TV show, comics, cartoons, commercials, you name it, uh, what do those things have to say about who ought to be and who should not be in power? So that'll be, that's sort of one clue is that they do have something to say about who deserves to be wealthy, who deserves the social status, the prestige, and who is not worthy. Now, so that's really what we're starting with, is that hypothesis. Uh, and then, I just say here in general, Neo-Marxists are critical of pop culture, they don't like pop culture artifacts, if they think that they just reinforce the idea that the poor deserve to be poor, whereas the rich are better people, just in general, and, and worthy of the power and prestige they enjoy in society. And so for the Neo-Marxists, you know, when it's, they, if they look at, say, America today, you know, they, they really have a lot of problems with it, right? Uh, and they don't want to see a movie that basically says it, it's just perfectly fine the way things are <laughs> you know they prefer films or you know they're critical of that kind of film uh, what they want to see are films that uh, you know ask tough questions and challenge some of this thinking make people uh, you know start questioning things maybe <laughs> eventually uh, rise up and I think uh, was it the Communist Manifesto if you read that uh, sort of the classic uh, work of communism and at the end of that, Karl Marx, Karl Marx literally says, you know, working class needs to unite. Right? So workers of the world, unite. <laughs> you know, come together and overthrow the, uh, these, these evil capitalists that have been oppressing you uh, and take over the factories and, and run them yourself. You know, so that's the classic Marxist uh, uh, position on these things. Yeah, so they argue that much of what we consider to be common sense on economic issues such as the American dream of equal opportunity and hard work paying off are actually just false beliefs foisted upon the gullible <laughs> a powerful ruling class. Now, so you don't hear too many neo-Marxists going around glorifying this concept of the American dream. You know, if you just come to this country and you're honest and you work hard and you, know, you make good grades and all this stuff then you'll be you'll have a nice house a nice family and everything will be uh, be great for you. You know, it's it's a totally uh, equal opportunity system. You know, neo marxists they, <laughs> they have a real problem with this. <laughs> they say this is really a false notion. Uh, really, all it does is kind of keep people calm, keep people uh, cooperative, keep people from rising up, even though they're in actuality being heavily oppressed. Uh, you know, basically they've been brainwashed by the. Uh, you know, the stuff we'll be talking about, pop culture artifacts, and it's kind of a complacence, uh, whereas really if they could be woken up, you know, if we could just wake them up to what's really going on, then they would, uh, you know, rise up and, and take over the uh, means of production. So you could, <laughs> you're probably picking up from my somewhat sarcastic tone. I don't necessarily uh, agree with all this, but I'm trying just trying to say it because that's, uh, you need to understand where they're coming from. Uh, okay, critical rhetoric. Uh, so the critical rhetoric is another term that's in this chapter. And you can, if you look into this term, this, this word critical has to do with critical theory. And this is that's kind of above where we are now in terms of our academics. But, uh, you know, a more advanced class, you might read some works of critical theory. It's basically uh, people that took what Karl Marx had written and, just, you know, basically took that to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a lot of people uh, were influenced, a lot of scholars were influenced by Marx and they wrote additional things about what the kind of things he was talking about, took it in different directions. Uh, and that's what critical theory is, basically. Um, but it has some things in common. Uh, one is that there's a social just, what, what I call anyway, a social justice agenda. So it strives to, quote, emancipate us from oppression by revealing the ways in which discourse, albeit intentionally or unintentionally helps create or maintain social and political uh, oppression. Uh, so the idea here is, again, all this pop culture stuff we're surrounded by, 
and not just pop culture, but everything from schools to religion, you know, you name it. It's all sort of there in a way to, again, keep people uh, playing along. Right? Uh, convince people that, you know, if you just keep following the rules, you keep, you know, doing things, uh, you know, you keep going along with the status quo, uh, everything will be fine, right? And, and that's just common sense. You know, even if you wanted to change it, you can't. <laughs> it's just the way things are. <laughs> Uh, so the idea of the, the neo-Marxist says that really, that's not true. It, this isn't how things um, have to be. Right? We, we could do things differently. Uh, we could embrace other policies and you know, so on and so forth. It's just that we don't <laughs> uh, because people have been basically brainwashed. So it doesn't matter if the creator of the artifact deliberately does these things. Uh, so sometimes what happens... You might have an author or a producer of a television show, let's say, and they say something like, uh, you know, I wanted this show to be anti-racist. You know, I had no desire whatsoever to make some kind of racial program. Uh, so they could say that all they want, and they may, may honestly believe that. Um, but the idea here is if, if we start doing some analysis of it, we might find out actually, even though you might not have intended it to do that, it nevertheless does, <laughs> you know, at least according from this uh, perspective we're working with. Uh, and, you know, the same thing we'll get into here. You know, you might have a show that at first uh, seems to kind of glorify the working class, right? And maybe uh, the main character is a, uh, you know, work has a blue collar background. I, I, I think a lot about Jim Varney Ernest P. Worrell, if you ever watch any of those Ernest movies. <laughs> so, so you might look at this and say, oh, look, it's, you know, they got this uh, working class guy, Ernest. You know, he's the hero of the film and he uh, what saves the day. He say, literally saves Christmas, you know. <laughs> Doesn't that seem to be a, a positive message? You know, saying it's, uh, you know, working class is great. Uh, but you could, you know, I think agree too that he's kind of this clownish figure right he's kind of <laughs> you probably don't want to be like Ernest <laughs> you know we kind of laugh at him uh, more than we want to be like him so you could say and that's an example where even if you talk to whoever made those Ernest movies <laughs> and they say no 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 this is this is a pro working class this, this is a pro uh, blue collar uh, movies and it doesn't matter what they say it doesn't matter if they believe that you know what, what matters is what how the audience receives it and what we, uh, you know, after we do this analysis, what, you know, we will have an argument to make irrespective of, uh, you know, just because that producer is saying something. All right, so critical rhetoric then is about unpacking how the norms, practices, and values of the dominant group oppress everyone else and keeps their voices from being heard and valued. And so, again, it's about uh, not just taking things at face value, but, you know, getting in there and start analyzing, you know, let's look at the characters, let's look at the what happens in the film, let's uh, see how uh, materialism or wealth is uh, portrayed in this and uh, how poverty is portrayed and so on and so forth. And, and we might come away with a very different analysis than what the producers might have come up with. Okay, hopefully this is making sense so far. I, <laughs> it's somewhat uh, difficult uh, material to work with, but uh, again, I'm just trying to make it as simple as I possibly can. Okay, so ideology and materialism. Uh, so we, we've talked about this a little bit before, this term ideology. So nowadays, you know, if you're, if you're in a class and they start talking about ideology, they don't really mean the same thing that a traditional Marxist means. So again, the neo-Marxist, the neo just means new. So these are kind of like Marx, Marxists, the next generation. <laughs> so like the original Marxist, or Karl Marx himself, if you read his books, when they talk about ideology, uh, they're basically talking about brainwashing. Uh, so these, the, the definition here is a false set of ideas perpetuated by the dominant political forces regarding materialism and consumerism. So these are, you know, words of wisdom, supposedly, um, uh, stories, you know, anything like that. It's just a, a way of looking at the world such that you feel like... Uh, Either we can't change the way things are now, or this is the way it should be. You know, it's there's a reason why this person over here is poor and you know have struggling just to you know put food on the table. Uh, well, that, that's unfortunate, but you know there's nothing we anybody can do about it. Right? That's just the way things are. And so, for the traditional Marxist, 
Uh, they would say, that's your ideology. You know, you, you've sort of been brainwashed in, into thinking that way. And the goal of, a Marx, of Marxism, then, is to waken you up to uh, new possibilities, right? There's, <laughs> you don't have to work for the, these horrible wages and, uh, you know, see the environment being destroyed and, and all this stuff. Uh, you can, in fact, do something about it, right? You just have to come together, unite as a class, working, you know, all the working class people get together, and then they, they'll have some power and they can, you know, you know confront the, uh, the capitalists. Uh, so like the traditional Marxist, neo-Marxists are materialist. Uh, so this is, again, a philosophical concept. I don't really want to get <laughs> too far into it. Uh, it's just the, the way I think about it is if you're a materialist, you're the opposite of what you might say, like an idealist. So when you're talking about material, you're talking about stuff, like property, you know, real life things. Uh, whereas an, an idealist, you know, of course, that's ideas, right? Less, less tangible things. Uh, so for the neo-Marxists, they're always, I kind of think about this as that, you know, these are the folks that are saying, it's, it's all about the economy, stupid. <laughs> it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> you know, I can't remember who said that. I think it was uh, uh, well, maybe uh, Bill Clinton, one of his uh, political uh, campaign managers or something. Uh, but anyway, I think that idea that it's the economy, stupid, kind of sums this up. You know, again, if you think about the economy then as being stuff, you know, people are making things in factories, they're producing things, there's uh, money, you know, cash. You know, these are the things that really matter. And stuff that's not tied to that, you know, if, there, if it has nothing to do with the economy, it's just kind of some ideas out there. Those are not really going to make much difference, right? And again, if you talk to somebody like that, <laughs> it's the economy stupid guy. <laughs> You know, he, uh, you know, they really make a big deal about things like the, like the income inequality. And so they, they will have a, like this little table here, and they'll always be talking about something like this. Um, you know, there's top 1% of people have this, you know, giant percent um, of the wealth in the country, GDP, whatever, uh, income growth. And the vast majority of the people have only a little bit of income. You know, so you have this tremendous differences in uh, wealth basically some people make a whole lot of money uh, but a lot of people the majority of people make relatively very little money and uh, so they say this is the real issue you know you can't none of that other stuff really matters if you've got so this massive income inequality and i have to say this is the part where i think we can we can all sort of agree with this i think intrinsically even if you're you know left or or right i think we see plenty of evidence I always think about the, like the justice system, and I get a lot of students talk about this too. How, um, you know, if two people are accused of a crime, and you know, one of those per, uh, one of those people is a millionaire, and the other person is, let's say, has only a very modest income, or maybe they're poor, you know, it, it seems hard to argue that the millionaire doesn't have some advantages, <laughs> right? All else being equal, just just being able to hire the you know, the best lawyers and, you know, uh, you know, all the benefits that come from that wealth. And, and so you sort of can see what they mean there. So all the other, all the other ways they might be, you know, un, uh, unfair or, uh, you know, unequal, uh, suffer, suffer from inequality. Uh, the wealth is, you know, it could well be the main thing, right? If you have uh, all us being equal again, if, if they were both millionaires, you know, we could <laughs> talk about that situation. But, you know, I think we would all agree that no matter what, uh, you'd probably want to be the millionaire uh, in a situation like that. Okay, so moving on. Uh, uh, Gramsci, uh, yeah, Antonio Gramsci, an Italian scholar, he, he picks up some of what Marx was saying, uh, but he puts a different spin on it. Uh, so for him... Uh, he, he's got this concept called hegemony. I always think about hegemony cricket, but <laughs> hegemony, <laughs> uh, which is the everyday practices, events, and texts that are interpreted subtly as natural to promote the interests of the empowered group. Uh, so for Marx, uh, classical Marx, uh, again, they, they keep talking about what they call the base. They say the society has a base and a superstructure. 
Uh, and the base is everybody that is basically making the stuff that we need to live. Uh, so people making stuff. Uh, that's the base. Uh, you take away the base, you've got nothing because <laughs> no food. It's kind of hard to have a, uh, a society with no food, you know, if you think about it. Uh, so yet everything's about that base. Uh, and then the superstructure is stuff that is built on top of that base. But for classical Marxists, that's really just not important stuff. You know, that's just kind of frivolous things to be thinking about. Uh, the important stuff is, again, the factories, the, the means of production. Uh, but Gramsci kind of rejected that. He says, well, I, you know, I think the superstructure, you know, and by that we're talking about, again, everything from pop culture to schools to government, you know, a lot more stuff uh, than just the factories, basically. Uh, he says, that's that could, maybe it's just as important, if not more important, that stuff. And he says here, hegemony is the privileging of a dominant group's ideology over that of other groups. So remember, the, for Marx, it was just uh, ideology, just a false thing. Right there, if you're, if once you kind of uh, are savvy, <laughs> once you're hip to the Marxism, <laughs> uh, then you're no longer uh, suffering from ideology. Right now, you've sort of, well, you're sort of awake, you're woken up to this, and um, you know, you're, you're clear sighted, I guess. Uh, whereas Gramsci was like, not so fast. <laughs> you know, you don't really, uh, there's no, you might trade one ideology for another ideology, but it's not like one is true and the others are false. Uh, it's just that some privilege some groups over others. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a hard concept to grasp, I, I know, but it's just kind of moving beyond this idea of um, you're either, you're either, you either have an ideology or you don't, and that's classical Marx, uh, whereas Gramsci's thing is, no, we, we all have ideology, or one idea, there, I guess there's multiple ideologies, and it's not like one is true and the others are not true. It's just that one ideology might work really well for this dominant class, um, whereas there could be other ideologies out there competing with that. And so that's really the key insight. You know, and if you believe, the reason this is important is if you believe this, uh, then you start to see how uh, pop culture can have some influence in this, right? If you've got pop culture that challenges this false ideology, if we want to call it the, the ruling class ideology, uh, you might have some stories, some movies, some films that tell a different story, right, and persuade people to adopt this, this other view. Uh, that can actually make a big difference, right? So it's not just about people in factories at this point, the people that are making stuff. You know, it's everybody from Hollywood film producers to students to, you know, people watching pop culture and knowing, uh, being able to analyze what, what they're watching. Okay, hopefully this is making some sense. <laughs> you know, every time I say that, I'm, my fear is it's not. <laughs> so, uh, always uh, write down questions as we go along, and you can certainly ask those, and uh, I'll try my best to answer them. Anyway, moving on, othering. This is a term, again, that comes up a lot, especially in modern stuff. You'll hear uh, the other, or this process of othering. And what it means, in, from a neo-Marxist perspective, is the devaluing consequence of hegemony that perceives those not in the empowered group as different from and as them. So it's kind of that classic us and them scenario. <laughs> you know, we're the good guys, and those, those people over there, they have different ways, and, you know, they're just so unfortunate <laughs> uh, not to have been part of this group. You know, that's the kind of thinking here. And one way I kind of remember what this means, I always think about surveys and how you see uh, sometimes on a survey they'll have multiple choice, so A, B, C, and D. Uh, so you might have uh, uh, something like uh, religion. What is your religion? Let's say that was the question on the survey. And let's say A was Christian. Uh, B, um, um, what do we want to put for Judaism, let's say. <laughs> Making this example up off the top of my head. So C, let's say C was Buddhism. And then D was other. Okay, so what happens there, try to imagine uh, being not... So A, B, or C didn't apply to you, so now you're clicking this other button. Uh, that kind of feels like you're kind of being uh, dismissed in a way. Like you didn't make, you know, these other three are legitimate options, but this one uh, just kind of feels like a catch-all group. 
you know, it's kind of like everybody else that doesn't, you know, fit into those other categories up there. Uh, you probably don't feel too good about, you know, having to put other, you know, in a situation like that. And I think, you know, when I think about that kind of situation, it starts to make sense to me, uh, you know, why they would use this term. Like, you don't want to be considered other because uh, that means you're kind of lumped in. You're just you're not part of the dominant group at that point. You're kind of just mixed in into, into this sort of miscellaneous uh, category. Probably not the best place to be in terms of power and prestige, right? Okay, for example, uh, in most fairy tales, the happy ending only comes when the protagonist magically becomes wealthy, noble, beautiful, etc. In other words, joins the dominant class, yes. Uh, so you do see this a lot in fairy tales, and sometimes I think people have a little bit of fun with, with some of this stuff. And it's kind of hard to tell how serious people are being with <laughs> some of these criticisms, but, you know, who knows? Uh, but like the Ugly Duckling, for example, is a classic, uh, so I guess, fairy tale. I'm not really sure who originally wrote the story, but, you know, you start off, I think it's uh, some ducks, and one of them, one of them is not a duck. <laughs> like a swan, a baby swan, I guess. And it gets kind of treated badly throughout the story, but then at the end, of course, it's revealed, you know, it's going to be fine because, you know, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're not ugly after all. You're beautiful. Uh, so that's the way, you know, the story ends happily. And, of course, the, with Rudolph, same sort of thing. Rudolph having the unusual uh, nose that glows. <laughs> <laughs> I always uh, like thinking about this one. Uh, so the argument there is he's kind of othered. And the only reason that story doesn't end tragically, I guess, <laughs> is when uh, Santa shows up and says, you know, hey, you could actually be quite useful. You know, you can join, you can become part of the dominant class of reindeer. You know, and, you know at this point, and that's the way the story ends, ends happily. It doesn't end with, you know, the other reindeer, uh, becoming enlightened enough not to other <laughs> Rudolph. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen by itself just because they get smarter. No, it's, you know, this thing has to happen uh, for Rudolph to advance into the ruling class. All right, this is where we get into the metaphor. Uh, so economic metaphors. Oops. Uh, so these are images, language, objects, events, or practices, basically anything that signifies something about the culture's ideas, norms, values, and practices regarding wealth and empowerment. Uh, so basically this could be any type of uh, pop cultural artifact we want to talk about. If it's got something to do in there with wealthy people versus poor people, uh, powerful people versus people with, with less power, uh, we could say that's really what that's saying is something about the economy and the uh, you know status quo regarding the haves and the have-nots and the you know the one percent you know whatever however you want to think about that you could take these stories like the ugly duckling or rudolph you know and make it about that because that this is actually an economic metaphor <laughs> the story about rudolph uh, the red-nosed reindeer you could say that's really about wealth and empowerment it's just a metaphor, right? So it's a way of thinking about um, the way wealth should be distributed, you know, in, in a society. Um, he, oh, oh, uh, so I thought this would be fun here, too. Uh, so that's, when I was thinking about economic metaphor, for some reason, I thought about the symbol. Now, a lot of people haven't done this. I don't you know. I guess a lot of people don't even use money anymore, like the, the paper money. Uh, but if, if you have some paper money, take out a dollar bill and flip it around and, and look at this symbol. <laughs> it's really, you know, you might not have ever really looked at this thing, but it's actually pretty weird. And there's some Latin phrasing on it. And this uh, top part says, He, meaning God, approves our undertaking. And then down here we have, a new order for the ages. But, you know, it's <laughs> an eyeball and an unfinished pyramid, and apparently there's uh, 13 of these uh, levels, you know, for the 13 colonies. There's, there's quite a bit of symbolism in this. Uh, but just to me, I, I just think this is fun just because it's so bizarre looking. Um, but you could say this is kind of an economic 
metaphor, and it's, it's literally printed on the money. <laughs> you know, it can't get more economic than actually being on the money. Uh, at least that's my my little uh, two cents on that. Or I guess a hundred cents. But, but anyway, moving on. Okay, uh, sites of struggle. Another term that comes up all the time in these articles. Uh, so what is a site of struggle? Uh, well, again, going back to Gramsci, remember Gramsci says there's different ideologies. You know, it's not just one uh, one fall or false, and then there's Marxism. You know, for uh, Gramsci, there's all these people with different ideologies, and you can see these kind of competing with each other, making different arguments, clashing with each other. And uh, where there's those points of contention, uh, that's, that's called a site of struggle. Uh, so those are where the ideological arguments about empowerment are contested. And the U.S. makes, it's pretty commonsensical, right? You watch, I mean, how many times have you watched shows on TV and thought, you know, that is just so, uh, you know, it's so fictional, right? There's just, I don't know any families that really behave like that. You know, this is just not the way it is. You know, this is nothing like my life. You know, they're de trying to depict a profession, let's say, and it's just really nothing like that in real life. You know, this is highly Hollywoodized or Disney-fied or, or, you know, something like that. Uh, so what you're really talking about that, when you're, when you're saying something like that, you're, what you're really talking about is a site of struggle. You're saying there's different ways, you know, there's sort of a conflict between what I'm seeing in the pop culture show and uh, what I know from my own actual life, you know, real life experience. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have these sites of struggle then. And so you might have two shows about farming, let's say, and, and one might um, be making one ideological argument about that profession. Another show might be making the opposite argument. Uh, and they call those readings. I know it's a weird way, weird word to use, but it's just a reading is going to be some type of argument about who deserves money, who deserves power, and who deserves not to have the power or to be disempowered or, or other. All right, so how does all this work? Uh, well, there's a writer named Althusser who uses this term interpolation, and it's very similar, I think, to Kenneth Burke. Remember when Burke uh, talks about identification? The way you persuade somebody is to identify your way with theirs. So when you hear about a cause and you think, well, I, you know, this, this group supporting this cause, uh, I really feel like I would fit in well with that group. I feel like I belong with them, uh, rather than th in this team over here. Uh, so, that, you know, Burke would say, well, that's because, you know, you're identifying, you're consubstantial uh, with that group, and that's how persuasion works. So this is very similar. Uh, interpolation uh, it's a little bit different, though, in that what it's saying is that when you read something or watch something, there'll be certain characters on the show that you kind of feel like, that's me. <laughs> that's You probably don't consciously think about it that way, right? But you, you sort of identify with that character uh, versus this other character over here who you might say, I, I don't identify with that character at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm nothing like that. Uh, when we get into the media perspective, they'll talk about how we kind of flatter ourselves sometimes uh, with, with this concept. Um, but anyway, it's just we have these texts out there, shows, movies, comic books, whatever, and they sort of call to us to, to fit in somewhere in that story to find a character we can identify with. And, and you know, at that point, we say that's a subject position. Right? We sort of, you know, all these subjects, <laughs> and they, have a, they occupy different positions, you know, within the hierarchy, and we'll find our way there We'll find some character in there somewhere that we identify with. And I would say probably if you had a show where you couldn't identify with anybody, you probably just wouldn't watch the show. It'd be incredibly boring to you. All right, a subject position might be an attractive model uh, that we wish to be like. So a character that uh, you want to be or you could see yourself being, you know, in that situation. Kind of feels like you or at least the best version of yourself or a less attractive anti-model. And that's the character you see as being other than yourself, right? Somebody that's nothing like you or very different from you. And so this is the way they, these work, right? They put characters in a story, and you got some characters that you 
hope, I guess, that the reader will identify with and want to be like, <laughs> sort of the, the positive character. Uh, and then you got these other characters put in there that are there to oppose the character, to be in conflict with them, and they have a different moral system of some sort. You know, basically, not necessarily villains or bad guys per se, but just characters that you don't really want to be identified with. <laughs> so, and so you got some examples here of, uh, and I'll ask you a question about this in a minute, but um, uh, in The Walking Dead, we have uh, Daryl and, and Merle, who are brothers, and then Andrea and, and Andrea here, and, and Amy, who are sisters. And so I think with these characters, you can see that uh, when people watch the show, they might identify very strongly with one or the other character. Uh, you know, maybe you feel like you're more like Daryl, or <laughs> probably nobody. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, so I, I want you to think about these pairs of characters. So Daryl and Merle and Andrea and Amy, and they're brothers and sisters, right? So which of these siblings would you consider to be the more of a model of the pair, and which one do you think is more of an anti-model? You know, and it could be clear, or there could be a little bit of back and forth. You know, I, I don't know. I just, that's what I want you to think about. So in either case, which brother or sister, so which of these four characters, I guess, do you identify with more strongly? Uh, so ponder on that for a few minutes, and then we will move on. Okay, uh, so now we have, uh, I guess, three, maybe you could get as many, five types of these readings. And again, remember, by reading, uh, we're talking about the ideological argument that that artifact is trying to make. Uh, and they say there's three types, or really, I would say, two basic types, and then we have some subtypes or subcategories. But the main thing is whether it's preferred or oppositional. So a preferred reading is one that reinforces the status quo ideology about empowerment by proposing, pr proposing, proposing, taking for granted, I can't talk, taking for granted assumptions as common sense. And so if it's a preferred reading, it will be something that in, in no way does this challenge the status quo. Right? So, and so depending on what society, I guess you're talking about there, you know, this is making the people that currently are in charge or the you know, the one percenters, if you will, and it makes them look good, you know, makes their way of life look like the right way of life, and you know, everybody should just go along with this system and be happy, <laughs> everything is fine, you know, this is how things are supposed to be. See, that is a preferred reading. Uh, you know, you could think about it negatively, like this would be the propaganda. Uh, now, the second one is kind of sneaky. So I kind of like the second one. I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> it's just kind of fun to think about. Uh, so this is what's called a cl occluded, occluded preferred. So what it's the sneaky bit is that it seems like this is actually opposed to the status quo ideology, but actually, <laughs> when you really look at it closely, it's not challenging it. It's actually reinforcing it. So that's a hard one to really wrap your head around. Uh, the book, or at least one of the editions of this book, talked about a show called Murphy Brown, which I don't know if you're familiar with that show or not. It might come up again in the feminism chapter. Uh, but I'll just give you the example, because I think it's a pretty good example. Uh, so that show, if I recall correctly, is about a very uh, powerful, prominent uh, female lawyer. And they said it was uh, seen to be oppositional, because, you know, at that time... This wasn't all that common, you know, to have a character like this, and so it was very positive. Uh, you know, she's depicted very smart, sophisticated, very good at her job, you know, so on and so forth. So, so that was an oppositional reading. But uh, the analysis or the sample essay they had talked about how, well, if you really look at it closely, what you see, what, what ends up happening is uh, Murphy Brown is is really unhappy. You know, she's professionally accomplished and successful, but uh, she seems to be, at least the character is depicted as having mi being missing something. Uh, you know, something's not quite right. And I think towards the end of the show, or maybe the last uh, part of it, <laughs> I guess spoiler alert. <laughs> Again, I've never watched the show. Uh, uh, but they said she gets married and has some kids, I think. And then now suddenly she, she's fulfilled, she's happy. It's like a happy ending. So they said that for that reason, 
you know, maybe it was preferred at first, but since it's, since it has the ending that kind of reinforces the status quo of the traditional uh, values, let's say, so it, it turned out to be an occluded preferred. You know, again, seemed to be saying one thing, but you know, by the end of it, that message had had changed and it was revealed, I guess, as, as something else. Uh, all right, <clears throat> and then oppositional. Uh, so these are the ones that are basically just the opposite of the preferred. Uh, so this will be something that challenges the status quo argument about who ought to and ought not to be empowered and why. Uh, and then there's two flavors of that. Uh, the subverted just does this directly, it's clear, uh, or does it totally, I guess. Uh, whereas inflected just means it's trying to bend uh, rather than just break the rules altogether. And I think they use the example of, <laughs> kind of an unfortunate example, <laughs> uh, of the Cosby Show. And they talked about how really that one, you know, at first you might think that's oppositional because, you know, it's kind of uh, inverting, I guess, typ the typical 50s sitcom, you know, in terms of race. But... Uh, the argument here was it really just kind of inflected that. So it wasn't really about upturning or revolution or overturning the basic moral, uh, morals of society, anything like that. It's just uh, we can sort of bend, we can sort of make the status quo bend a little bit to be more inclusive uh, and let, you know, let more, uh, you know, open up new possibilities, but not really change the, the structure of the whole thing, right? So it's not like a, a big systemic change, just kind of a, you know, basically a modification. Like we can tweak it <laughs> to make it work. <laughs> and so that's called like the inflection. It's kind of like tweaking it to make it work a little bit more inclusively. Uh, whereas a subversion thing would be just outright, you know, we need to overturn uh, the system. So I have some fun examples here at the bottom. I don't know how we'll <laughs> be able to see this. <laughs> you know, but if you watch the old Batman uh, TV show, you know, you got these, the, the millionaire uh, playboy and, and his ward. You, know, you could think about which of those readings, what kind of reading that is. You know, these, these really rich people that uh, have all this crime-fighting equipment. And, of course, from our own uh, Walking Dead comic, we've got lots of uh, <laughs> disturbing things that happen. <laughs> you know, you really worry sometimes about uh, the hegemony and ideologies of some of the people that you meet in, the, in that comic. And then one of my favorites over here, just the uh, movie Office Space. I think I've had some students that wrote their uh, essays about office space, uh, just again, because it does, it is about jobs in the office, you know, the haves and the have-nots, and who gets to be a manager versus an employee, <laughs> and does the, uh, working in an office like this kind of make you insane? You know, there, there's, it's a fun um, artifact to uh, analyze. Okay, uh, a few last things then. One of the terms they bring in here, they just kind of pop it in, is intertextuality. I'm not really sure why it's introduced in this chapter. <laughs> Might as well cover it uh, since it is in here, though. And so what intertextual means, it's, uh, I'll just read the definition, a blending of texts in ways that make it difficult, if not impossible, to separate them from prior texts, contexts, and any other utterances that surround them. And just to uh, clarify this a little bit, I think it's useful to think about the opposite of this, which would be a close reading. And you might have uh, taken an English class and they might have done something called close reading. And that means you, you don't look at any kind of secondary material, right? You don't worry about the historical context. Uh, you don't need to know anything about the author and what the author may or may not have intended. Uh, with close reading, you just look at that one text, that, that one poem, you know, right there on the page, and it's like a self-contained thing, and that's how you should interpret it. So intertextual, intertextuality is the opposite of that. So that's saying we, to understand it, we have to bring in all this other stuff. And nothing is really self-contained. Right? That poem is going to have elements that relate or somehow refer to this other poem and you know, this other stuff, and you know, it goes on and on <laughs> infinitely. <laughs> kind of like the six degrees of separation applied to... Uh, in literature. And I, I got some pretty good examples in the book, but I, I just think memes are a really good example of intertextuality because a lot of the times when you look at a meme, if you think it's funny, it's because you're able to connect all those different uh, texts 
you know, by text, you might mean another, another meme, uh, a show. Uh, but if you know all the stuff that's being referred to, you laugh because basically you have, uh, you know, you're capable of making the intertextual leap. Uh, whereas if you look at it and it's not funny or you don't get it, you know, that's not your fault. It's just that you haven't, you know, looked at these other texts uh, around. So like this meme here, we've got uh, Carl from The Walking Dead. So you, you need to be familiar with, with Carl, who that is, the show. And he says, I just killed my mother. So you need to know a little bit about his the character of Lori and probably know why. <laughs> know a little bit about some of the forum discussion. Uh, the fan communities where they just really don't like her character at all. And so you have to know all that. And then this bottom part here is, of course, Grumpy Cat. <laughs> I don't know if, you're, if, you're, if you've seen these memes before, but there's a whole bunch of these, kind of this uh, early viral phenomenon of this uh, somewhat grumpy-looking cat and a lot of the fun slogans that go along with, uh, you know, sort of, sort of persnickety or sort of uh, funny negative things. <laughs> I don't know, don't know how to describe it quite, quite uh, right at the moment, but if you know all that stuff, then you'll think this is funny. But if you really think about that, that's quite a bit they're expecting you to know in order just to get a joke. Okay, uh, so how do you actually do a neo-Marxist analysis? Uh, well, the first step, of course, finding a text that has some kind of clear economic metaphor. So remember, this will be have, you're basically going to be saying this has something to do uh, with wealth distribution, income jobs, professions, uh, social status, uh, professional trades, you know. Uh, so for just a couple off the top of my head, uh, uh, there's a, one of my favorite shows. It's called uh, Dirty Jobs. I've talked about, I've probably mentioned it a few times, but it's about a, it's a documentary series with a guy named uh, Mike Rowe. And he, 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 the show is kind of about these, uh, I guess blue collar jobs that are literally dirty. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like filthy work, right? You know, you're 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 swimming around in sludge or, or something uh, unpleasant. Uh, but the theme of the show is that you know it, it looks like a horrible job that nobody would want. Uh, but the subtext there is these people are actually doing fine. <laughs> you know, they, usually they make quite a bit of money actually. And they really like their job, and they have a good community that they work with, and it's actually a, a better way of life uh, than doing something that might be more lucrative, tied to a college degree, let's say, you know, working in an office environment, uh, something along those lines. Uh, so I would say that that'd be a pretty good thing to analyze. You could get into that and see what what is it really? What is the reading there? Is that opposed? Is it preferred? Some variation thereof. Um, we just we mentioned office space is another possibility, uh, but really any show that has some kind of economic factor in it, which is basically anything, <laughs> uh, can be analyzed with this. Uh, okay, to examine the text, so the subject positions you can, you look at the characters in there and you say who are the models, who are the anti models. Uh, so the book mentions the show Saved by the Bell, which is probably pretty dated by this point, but uh, I think it's Zach is the and uh, who's the other guy? Blanking on some of the names, but but Zach is like the cool guy, and Screech is the uh, sort of nerdy guy. I see you'd say he's uh, Zach is the model, and Screech is the anti-model. Uh, what's that show that has uh, um, Family Matters? Yes, Family Matters. I had to look that up. <laughs> so yeah, Urkel. If you remember uh, the, that that show, you know, there Urkel is kind of the, the anti, he's kind of the Screech-like character in that show. He's the anti-model. Uh, so you could probably do that for most shows, right? Uh, you could, Walking Dead, you know, we could talk about Rick and, and uh, Shane, or Rick and the governor. Yeah, there's lots of ways to pair that. Uh, examine characters' possessions, wealth, power, status, etc., right? So who's... Who's depicted as having uh, the stuff, you know, the material wealth, the, the goods, <laughs> uh, the power in this society? And is that shown in the step C? I uh, said, so you might say, well, uh, the governor in The Walking Dead has basically has it made. Uh, you know, got all the, it looks like a really well ordered society. They got safety, they got plenty of food, you know. 
Uh, whereas Rick's group, you know, they're really struggling. You know, they're just in constant danger, etc. Uh, C. Determine whether wealth and power are shown as positive or negative. Yeah, that's not coming back to our example. Just uh, from that example, you could say that yeah, the governor has that stuff. Woodbury, you know, it it has a. It's a pretty good place to live, you know, just in terms of uh, wealth, I guess, and possessions. But it's kind of negative. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this show, I don't think anybody watches that and thinks, wow, the governor is such a great guy, such a great leader. <laughs> no, of course not. You think uh, he does have stuff, but it's it was he hasn't um, accumulated this stuff in an ethical, acceptable way. Uh, whereas Rick, you know, they, they may not have as much stuff, but, you know, they're shown in a much more positive light. All right, and then three, evaluating the potential implications. And so here again, we're just thinking about just beyond the show itself uh, and even beyond the people who watch the show. Uh, is this a good thing? You know, are the messages in this healthy or are they unhealthy? And so again, for the neo-Marxist, if you're coming at it from that neo-Marxist perspective, you would say, well, it would be good. It would have a good potential implication if it was oppositional you know, if it made people think uh, and uh, think more about income inequality, let's say, uh, social status, you know, all, all those sorts of things. Uh, whereas it would be uh, bad, it would have negative potential implications if it only just reinforced uh, the status quo. Okay, so let's uh, wrap it up then with this. So take a few minutes. Uh, you can rewatch the scene if you like. It'd probably be helpful, actually. I don't remember exactly where it is, but oh, you might be able just to remember this enough to do this uh, mini-analysis, let's call it. So just think about some of the characters in the episode Tell It to the Frogs, who come from poor working-class backgrounds. Uh, so we've got Ed, Carol, or Ed Pelletier, uh, Jim, Merle, uh, or, you know, other characters. There's, there's some characters that appear to be working-class and sometimes the show doesn't make it clear, doesn't actually ever say what, what they did before the uh, apocalypse, uh, so you might just have to guess. <laughs> uh, but anyway, just ask, uh, talk about that a little bit, and which characters are portrayed, or are the working class characters portrayed as powerful and admirable, or are they portrayed somehow as weak, dishonest, somehow heavily flawed, compared to characters from wealthier, wealthier or better educated backgrounds, uh, such as Andrea. Uh, so I think about 100 to 200 words should be pretty good on that. Uh, so maybe pick, uh, you know, for example, Ed and, uh, and Andrea here, and compare those and just think about which, you know, what are their backgrounds, and then uh, how, does this, how does the show depict them? And can you think of some counterexamples maybe? So maybe there's a working class character that isn't portrayed negatively and, and, and vice versa. Uh, so, say, um, so I had some fun with that. <laughs> uh, let me stop now, though, and I'll talk to you next time.